or good evening. Uh, for all of our friends around the world, I have Gita Sekon, who's been a good friend of mine for not long enough. Um, and she's coming in from Delhi, India. So we wanted to time it that all of our viewers from India and from places around the world will be able to see it. Those in Hawaii and those on the West Coast are going to have to get up very early. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about Gita and then I'll let her tell you uh, about herself. When I started doing work in India, I started on LinkedIn and we just decided that we needed to do a cyber safety program um, in India. And we arrived uh, to do part of Art of Living's World Culture Festival with 3 million people in person. And the headlines in the newspaper said, uh, cyberbullying is worse in India than it is any place else. So I asked my husband to reach out and find the cyber safety group for India. And he came back and said there wasn't one. And then I said, okay, uh, find the cyberbullying group in India. And he said, there isn't one. So I turned to a number of people and they said, you have to do it. And I complained and said no. And eventually we decided to do that. And I reached out on LinkedIn to find other experts from India who could help us. Now, Gita and I have a common friend, uh, a very special person who you'll meet on one of the lives. It's Bob Schilling, Robert Schilling. And um, he, Bob had been... Uh, involved in sex crimes out of Seattle and law enforcement. And he himself actually had been victimized as a nine-year-old boy. So he brought some special um, empathy to the issue. He was eventually seconded to Interpol in Lyon as the first American seconded to Interpol on a major uh, task force. And he was running crimes against children. I was talking about him and Gita saw that and recognized that we both knew and, and admired and loved Bob. And uh, we started chatting. So when I got to India, I invited her to join me for breakfast. Uh, she sat down and I knew I had found a soul sister. Now she knows far more than uh, just about anybody in the world on sex trafficking of children. She does extraordinary work. She advises everyone, but primarily the United Nations. Uh, she trains law enforcement. Um, so I want you to meet her. She's my friend, she's my mentor, and she's my soulmate. So Gita, would you introduce yourself? Hi, Barry. Thank you. Uh, as I've always felt, you are very, very generous in your compliments about me. I have mentioned this to her in private, and I don't mind going public about it, that I truly do not deserve them. Uh, as I say, I'm an armchair academician uh, practitioner, but I haven't gone out into the fields like Parry and scores of you who have logged in today have. So I do accept what she said only because I know if my father and my mother were alive and with us, they would have been truly proud hearing this. So on their behalf, I just accept the good words that uh, Parry had to say about me. Uh, regarding my journey into this field, I think I've lived multiple lifetimes in one life. I started my legal career by joining the Indian Navy in the Judge Advocate General's branch, what is commonly known in America and Canada as the JAG. Uh, I happen to be from the pioneer batch of women officers in the Indian Navy. I served the Navy for a short while, moved on to academics, teaching law, and then one fine day without knowing how yet I'm trying to figure out, I found myself in the UN system working on human trafficking, working on child sexual abuse and exploitation. And uh, my ground, my learning has been on uh, the legal aspects of this. So I'm not really a specialist on other issues related to child abuse or human trafficking. But uh, when you understand the crime, you cannot really uh, do without understanding the socio-economic, cultural and political factors because of which these crimes happen. And uh, so that's just in brief uh, about me. And I look forward to uh, talking less maybe and getting more of uh, questions from people who've found uh, very generously their time today to join us. Thank you, Perry. Well, thank you, Gita. A lot of people are logging in and they're sending hearts and like, 
likes and they're wondering why I'm responding using my husband's account. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll explain a little. LinkedIn Live is very new and not all of the pieces are working. And even if they are, I'm not a techie. I just play one on TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I, in order to see the comments and your questions and your likes, I have to use a different computer because the broadcast screen that we're using doesn't show those. So I'm flipping back and forth between my husband's computer and mine. Um, so thank you very much to everybody who's logging in and saying hi and doing the rest. Gita, before we went live, mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about where we are. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm a lot older than you are. I'm 68 years old and I've been doing this for 25 years mm -hmm. and I'm getting tired. And, uh, you know, Alan and I looked at, and my husband's been doing child sexual exploitation longer than I have. He's been doing mm -hmm. it since 1985 mm -hmm. um, from Canada. And as we started looking back over mm -hmm. what we had done and what we had accomplished and our goal. Mm -hmm. It just felt like every time we took a step forward, there were two steps back. Every time we shut down a sex trafficking group, five more would pop up. Mm -hmm. Every time we rescue a child, there's so many more who are being trafficked. And mm -hmm. I wonder if we are accomplishing what we hoped. I wonder uh, how much hope we have. And I know I was going to end with that, but I think maybe if we talk about the realities of working in the space, it might be mm -hmm. helpful. Sure. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the word hope because I had two quotes, which I've always uh, used very liberally. Uh, the first one is from Mahatma Gandhi, the tallest leader of the Indian freedom movement, who said that the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leaves to its children. I'm also reminded when you use the word hope uh, of what Rabindranath Tagore, the Nobel Prize for Literature winner in 1913, 1913 from India, said about children, that every child comes with the message that God is not yet discouraged of man. So if this is what we think about our children today also, then why is it that we are grappling with these issues of child abuse, of child sexual abuse, whether it is online or offline, whether it is in the form of child trafficking. And before I say, what is the current scenario? What is the global trend? What is it that is happening even in India? Just a little bit of uh, it on India. Uh, I think we need to go back to understand the magnitude of the problem because a comprehensive picture emerges when we look at the problem in its perspective and where it is based. So when we talk of child sex trafficking, we know that no country is immune from trafficking. We know that more victims are being reported and more traffickers are being convicted than at any time over the past 13 years, and which could really be a result of increased institutional capacities to identify victims, or it may also be an increased number of trafficked victims. Now, most of the sources which I'm quoting are from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime reports of 2016 and 18. They also come from UNICEF, ILO and other sources. If you look at the profile of the victims, we know that traffickers are mainly targeting women and girls, whether it is for sexual exploitation or whether it is for labor. Not to suggest that men do not form a major part of it. What are the numbers that we are looking at? We are looking that traffic children, both boys and girls together, they constitute about 30% of the victims around the world. In terms of sexual exploitation, girls are about 26% and there are boys too at 3%. But together, the children make up about one fourth of the victims. When we look at child forced labor, it is here that children again form 25% of the component. So we are really looking at a very large number of children which are being trafficked, whether it is for organ removal, whether it is for illicit adoptions, marriages, exploitative begging, drug mules, carriers, any other kind of criminal activity for the production of pornographic material or to be used as child soldiers into sex tourism, into sex exploitation. I mean, we can really go on. But th that's the uh, state that we are in today in terms of child trafficking. 
If I were to just pick up some figures from India, then we just have uh, uh, the government release its annual crimes in India report. It's a 2017 figure. The new reports are yet coming out. We have just about 5,000, about 6,000 cases out of which 3,500 plus are on child trafficking. What does the global slavery index estimate tells us? That in 2016, maybe there were 8 million people living in modern slavery in India. If you look at the difference between a few thousand and the millions of people that other international NGOs are talking about, I think it's a huge disparity which uh, fails explanation. And where does the truth lie? Somewhere in between regarding the number of victims. So when we're talking about uh, online abuse, uh, again, just putting the problem in perspective, and this is from a January 2019 data from a site called, website called We Are Social. So if the world has 7.6 billion population, it is 5.1 billion mobile phone users, 4.3 billion internet users, 3.4 billion social media users, and 3.2 billion of those who use social media on mobile phones. Let's come to India. 1.3 billion, huge population, 1.1 billion mobile subscriptions, 560 million internet users, 310 million social media users, 290 million mobile social media users. Why is this relevant? Because we are second among top 20 internet user countries in the world. If Facebook was a country in itself, then we would have about 270 million Facebook users in India, which is a leading country in terms of Facebook audience size. We download and use apps higher than the global average. Unfortunately, we have no data on internet usage by children as to what component of our population is children using the internet. However, uh, an old study of Microsoft in 2012 ranked India third uh, for high online bullying rates among 25 countries where the survey was conducted. What I'm trying to therefore suggest is that these problems were there, these crimes were being committed from before. But the online aspect, the online use of technology, internet and its usage by children has just exacerbated. It's just multiplied this problem. And when we come to it later, I would share some interesting case studies from India, which are very unique and which you would not find possibly from the rest of the world, because that is what bases the problem in the specific cultural context. This is the trend that we are seeing. And you would notice every kind of crime being committed, whether it is global or whether it is in India, ranging from cyber blackmailing, threatening, harassment, fake profiles, cyber pornography, or what we call child sexual abuse images or material, obscene material, uh, sharing and hosting, publishing material, cyber stalking, bullying, internet crimes through online games and others. Yeah. So it's the entire range, whether we talk globally or whether we talk about India. Well, you know, one of the things I recognized in India was that you went from very little access to an explosion of 5G and 4G everywhere from mm -hmm. demonetization when I was in Delhi and mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Modi took all of the small bills out of circulation and overnight required people to use mm -hmm. digital payments, even in some little villages where there's no electricity or toilets um, uh, or plumbing. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, it's an interesting country, which is why I was thrilled to create Cyber Safety India and contribute what we have. But mm -hmm. it's also a country of surprises. And those surprises are very helpful as we look around the world. Uh, when I spoke, um, when I spoke uh, the first time at the World Culture Festival, there was a leadership mm -hmm. forum afterwards. And I spoke on a panel of incredible people. And mm -hmm. when we were done, there was a line of about 500 people who, who stood there wanting to talk to me about the work I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and the first three women were very simple saris, and they were standing there. This was my second full day in India. Um, mm -hmm. And they said, we work with street children. 
-hmm. And I said, oh, God bless you. This is amazing. Thank you so much for your work. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we need your help. And I said, I, that's beyond my skills. I'm a digital mm -hmm. crime and, and, and risk management professional. But mm -hmm. the three children are, are facing things I don't understand. And they mm -hmm. said, no, 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 it's, it's, it's digital. So mm -hmm. I said, digital, these children don't have food. They don't have toilets. They don't have a place to sleep. They don't have anything. Mm -hmm. They're having digital problems. And apparently they find discarded cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, and they are given SIM cards. Mm -hmm. And the SIM cards are loaded with images of child sexual exploitation. To mm -hmm. group them. They don't need internet access. These mm -hmm. phones that don't have accounts can use Wi-Fi, um, mm -hmm. which is now a lot more prevalent in, in India. And mm -hmm. they are being groomed with content that's loaded on the SIM cards on their phone. Now, I didn't mm -hmm. even recognize that SIM cards could do that. And Mm -hmm. Together, you and I started putting pieces together and realizing that in rural areas where they're doing construction or their construction sites where men are brought in from everywhere and live in tents uh, mm -hmm. to do work and then will wander into the town briefly on a weekend, that they are buying these SIM cards filled with sexual exploitation, rapes, torture of mm -hmm. women and men and children. And mm -hmm. those SIM cards sell for more money. Mm -hmm. they're, they're local victims. So if you can spot the woman on the street or know where she lives or see that child, those mm -hmm. are more in demand. And we started seeing digital sexual abuse that really wasn't digital at all. It was just contained in a chip on a device that wasn't even part of the cell phone system. So mm -hmm. we're seeing ways around the typical way that we look in North America and in Europe, as mm -hmm. people are becoming very good at hiding mm -hmm. and moving these images and trafficking and molesting our children and women in mm -hmm. ways they didn't before. Mm -hmm. So how troubling is this? I mean, every day we have to find a new way and see inside the head of these people. Um, I find it very troubling. Uh, yes, Barry. Uh, it's interesting you do mention India as a very separate and a unique kind of a country. And two things which is uh, really brought on the internet boom uh, is uh, uh, the government's own digital push uh, towards digital literacy, towards digital citizenship, towards digital governance. So the government itself is pushing this, which is a very good thing to happen. But this government is new. Uh, it's just about six years old now. And Indians had very good access to internet even earlier because of the fact that India has the cheapest mobile data rates anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. It's just a few cents and it gives a lot of data, one GB, two GB, and uh, provides you free calls as well as SMS services, etc. So it's the cheapest mobile data rates with the fact that very large parts of the population does speak English. So it is two, three of these factors which make the proliferation of the internet, the mobile phone technology, etc., uh, very, very accessible to large masses of the population in India. It's interesting you also mentioned the uh, street children because when we met the very first time, uh, this is what uh, we did discuss. And I mentioned that when these street children do get, and it got validated when you spoke to the other women who worked in the area, that uh, these are the children who get the hand-me-down phones. Uh, these are the children who then go to those very small grocery shops. And for uh, as small a sum as just 20 rupees, which is really a few cents, they can easily get a 10-minute small pornographic film downloaded on their phones, which they can see again and again and again. That's the kind of uh, access that uh, we are talking about. Uh, when you also mention about uh, made to order kind of digital uh, small clips, which are really maybe not using only children, but these are actual case of gang rapes. Uh, what is known as a gang rape in India is uh, multiple perpetrators causing that violence on one woman or that one child. So there would be these gang rapes which would be recorded live without naturally without the fear of the law by the perpetrators who were doing this and then they were streaming it 
online. And then it got shared WhatsApp to WhatsApp, which then led one of the NGOs in India, uh, known by the name of Prajwala, uh, who actually works on anti-trafficking, to take this to the Supreme Court and show them and file a public interest litigation on how rampant it was. That caused a lot of good changes uh, with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, our Ministry of Home Affairs or Ministry of Interior Affairs taking it up to investigate these cases themselves. Uh, but, but without digressing from the subject, what is also very interesting in India is that, uh, that, that people are actually uh, demanding and if we understand how trafficking works and if we understand how any of this exploitation works whether online or offline it's about the simple business principles of demand and supply and so what really people are demanding is not to see uh, some kind of a filmed pornographic film as in a blue movie uh, a blue film what they really want to see is a, an actual uh, maybe sexual intercourse between uh, two intimate partners or between a couple who have taken rented a room in a rest in a hotel who've maybe gone on their honeymoon or stuff mm. so all this is now surreptitiously getting recorded and this is what is being sold because there's a demand for it i want to also share this uh, a very interesting piece of information that the railway ministry which is one of the very huge ministries in india is making Wi-Fi freely accessible on its railway platforms. Now it's a government uh, scheme and they want to do this to make internet more accessible to people. But when research was done on one of the railway platforms, and I don't want to name that, but it's a part of the government report, and one of the North Indian states, just one platform, what were people downloading and st streaming? Porn. Porn. Yes. It's, so you know, that is... <laughs> so uh, there's a flip side to both of this there it makes uh, the internet has been made very accessible which is really a very good thing and yet on the other side we see the nefarious side of the demand that people are creating with naturally evil intentions and the way that demand is getting fulfilled but that's where you know when you mention the word if i may uh, take just another 30 seconds is uh, when you mention just before we got into this live uh, we were talking about whether, you know, when we say these things, are we fear mongering? What you said when you started working 25 years back. And really to put this in perspective, this live talk, the work that you do, the work that I do, or the work that anyone else does in this field is about balancing protection and privacy. Because we recognize the children's right to privacy. We recognize their right to protection. But somehow in India also there is this strong narrative that builds which questions the imperative of privacy in the Indian social milieu and considers it to be a luxury, uh, especially since we live in congested and uh, limited spaces. And then it also gets complemented with the narrative of public security and terrorism which we face. What we are trying to tell everyone through this live is we recognize the benefits of technology and its potential to empower children and others together with the recognition of the resourcefulness and the evolving capacity of children to really take an active and responsible role in their own protection and that of others. And that really must lie at the heart of all initiatives. So I did want to put that as a caveat up front that this is not about denying children or anyone the right to internet, as we say, because we are now, our, one of our high courts has said internet, access to internet is a human right. I'm, I'm still debating that in my head in a country where we don't have access to clean air, clean water and food um, with the world's highest malnourished children really is internet a human right. So it, it's, a, it's a high court judgment and rightly so uh, we need to commend the judges for holding that but in my head I'm still debating whether it would still be in sub-Saharan Africa and in <laughs> India. So well, that, that's on a lighter note but uh, that was really what I wanted to tell you in response to your question. I think all of the viewers now understand why <clears throat> you were the first guest I had to talk about the issue that is the most important to me, which is putting our children first. Um, yes. So we're getting a lot of comments and a lot of people who are complimenting you, 
who think that uh, the statistics and, and your approach has been extraordinary. We've had Thank a number you. of organizations who've offered their support and people who want to know how to help. So we'll address that too. Um, there is uh, a woman it, it involved in psychology uh, from mm -hmm. the United States who said that at a recent event, there were some Indian delegates who talked about the problem of sex trafficking and mm -hmm. adoption. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody else had asked about sex trafficking and um, and uh, and refugees. So, w can you address that a little bit? Sure, uh, I would address the refugee problem first because there's very little to stay, uh, say. Uh, India has been really a welcoming civilization for all kinds of refugees in the world. Uh, we are really the melting pot of every single religion that you can find on the earth with all its sects and subsects. And uh, we're really, really proud of the fact. We hope that through our liberal democracy, we are able to continue that and provide a welcoming and a safe home to those who are most in need of it. So currently why this discourse comes up about trafficking and the refugee problem is because of the Rohingya refugees, which have come to India from uh, Myanmar there are more of them in Bangladesh. There are less of them in India, but it is the vulnerability of any individual which makes them, uh, I mean, which makes them vulnerable to trafficking, which makes them vulnerable to exploitation. And it's a breeding fertile ground. The refugee camps are always breeding fertile grounds for traffickers, offering the refugees better work, uh, offering the refugees to be smuggled if they have a little more money and maybe then get them trafficked. So that is uh, an issue which keeps coming up in discourse with few of the NGOs which work on migration related issues, especially to make migration safe. Uh, but, but we don't have really any data or statistics to support that. There's more of anecdotal evidence. There's more of the NGO narrative rather than something officially coming up. But, but, but NGOs are right when they say that because traffickers go hunting in at-risk populations, which are the most vulnerable. And who could be most vulnerable than a refugee living in a refugee camp, either waiting to go back home or to get some kind of a better status in the country, which they now want to call home. Addressing the issue of trafficking for adoption, uh, especially within the country and by foreigners, I would say, again, not a very, very big problem from India. Uh, we do have instances, a large number of foreigners who come to India to adopt children. Uh, there's been a very major Supreme Court judgment about more than 20, 25 years back, which for the first time put in place regulations on foreign adoptions from India, because uh, one of the NGO people, it's, it was again a public interest litigation. And I think the Supreme Court of India has done stellar work on uh, human rights jurisprudence through public interest litigations in India. Yeah, and I, think I, I mm -hmm. wanted to address that just for a moment, Gita. It's sure. something that we're not seeing outside of India. And I was, I was very enthused to see how much is being done with lo lawyers working with NGOs and child mm -hmm. advocates to change policy within India mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. court action. Um, and even sure. Kailash's son has been uh, the Nobel laureate from India. His son has been very active as a lawyer before the courts. And, mm -hmm. and we're seeing a lot of changes that might not have happened if someone hadn't brought it to court. Yes. Uh, so uh, what really gets reported now and really makes for like a Bollywood thriller is the efforts of NGOs who are trying to trace the parents of those children who were adopted 20, 25, 30, 40 years back. Uh, maybe they gave their children to the orphanages saying that the child is really not an orphan, but can you bring up the child? There were these orphanages which went looking for children so that they could populate their orphanages. And then without the parents knowing it, these children were given up in adoption. And there are there are times when a person is now a grown up adult of 35 with children of their own, a man or a woman, and who now want to come back to India, tracing their roots, trying to find their biological parents. And there are very minuscule number of NGOs, one or two, maybe one or two good minded citizens who are trying to get this done. Uh, by tracing the parents. So it makes for very good Bollywood kind of a story reading when it appears as a journalistic article. 
But uh, whether any government agency is compiling this data, really not. Whether any, there are cases where FIRs are lodged, uh, that's a different issue. But uh, whether there we have firm data and statistics to tell you how many children may have got adopted, we don't have those numbers. But we know that India, for the past at least 30 years or so, has been a very favored ground for foreigners to come and adopt. And when I say foreigners, I mean uh, people from the Western world, people from Europe. We in India always, we have also adopted our own children, but for the preference of a male child, uh, the girl children would not get adopted. It is changing now, but it is so. Uh, children with any kind of disabilities would not get adopted by Indians. And these were all always adopted by foreigners. Now, because of this trend about uh, 25, 28 years back that one of the lawyers went to the Supreme Court in a public interest litigation asking what is the motivation of these foreigners to come to India and adopt these children who really Indians do not want to adopt. And the Supreme Court then realized that there was something maybe amiss and they made their guidelines, which then prompted a policy decision. And when you mention the work of uh, NGOs or uh, independent lawyers or individuals who have gone to the Supreme Court and exercised the public interest litigation jurisdiction, which is a special jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. It has really led to uh, very, very marked improvements in uh, policies which were either existent or which were non-existent then led to the framing of new policy, such as in the adoption, the Central Adoption Resource Agency, which is a federal government agency, was then forced to draft its own policy on adoption of children by foreigners such that the child's right to adoption remains. The parent's right to adoption remains whether an Indian or a foreigner, but how it should never, the child should not be bought and sold because the orphanages were really trafficking children in the name of uh, giving them up in adoption. Uh, we are seeing traces of it in Nepal now. What is even more disturbing is this kind of volunteerism, as they call it, uh, mixing the two words of volunteering and tourism and how that is now being frowned upon uh, by the world, especially by Nepal, because it's now becoming a breeding ground for trafficking children into the orphanages, leading to this kind of volunteerism where people just paradrop, think they want to do good, feel good about themselves naturally, not the children, and then go back home putting pictures on Facebook and everywhere. So there are these new trends which we have to be aware of by orphanages, have these children, why adoption centers have these children? Are they really orphans? What is the motive? Uh, never to discount the fact that there are really the good ones and then there are the bad ones and there are the ugly ones. So like in every part of the world, we have to deal with the good and the bad and the ugly. Yeah, there's so far more ugly, I think, than a lot of people realize. People are commenting, saying wonderful things and a viewers like Ron and others who are logging in while they're at work and they're trying to sneak it in. Uh, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of the viewers have asked me to give credit to organizations or agencies. We can't do that in a live. I don't know enough about the companies involved. I'm happy to address that later on. So you'll have to forgive mm -hmm. us for not addressing those. Um, but I, I want to get back into maybe what people don't know that they uh -huh. need to know. So as we're traditionally child sex trafficking and sexual exploitation either occurred with someone who knew the child well, uh -huh. uh, it may be in, in incest, it may be friends of the family, it may be a coach, it may be a teacher, it may be someone who uh -huh. knew the child well and was exploiting that child or maybe several. And then we had those who were engaged in a larger um, organization, often a larger complex of sex trafficking where they would support each other. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a number of cases that we worked in online where mm -hmm. these large groups of sex trafficking groups actually had legal defense funds that were put in mm -hmm. place by the wealthier mm -hmm. members in the mm -hmm. event that any member was caught they would be able to reach out to well-placed lawyers to try to suppress any investigation before the more mm -hmm. influential were caught. And we're seeing a lot of, when we talk about adoption and we talk about um, workforce uh, slavery and, and sexual abuse and a lot of the issues that we're seeing on refugees, we need to recognize that often in big cities, when you have large conferences of 20,000, 25,000 40,000 people who fly in for three days. They have a hotel room, 
They are away from prying eyes. And often the traffickers are selling children to them to molest over the weekend. And a lot of these men who aren't traditionally uh, pedophiles will engage in sex because they believe that the children are less likely to carry carry STDs. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's happening everywhere. What are you seeing on the sexting sextortion arm? Gita, what are you seeing out of India in some of the uh, developing countries? Uh, Sure. Uh, Just to get back to the point which you made about uh, uh, the the pedophiles, uh, the the sex traffickers or the pedophiles or those who are interested in children in the wrong way, uh, having their own support groups, uh, it goes without saying that pedophiles have their own training manuals. They do. People who are who've logged in and who may not have been exposed to this uh, issue just need to log in on Google simply, and they will find how to love children. Uh, they will have find their own manuals on how to record uh, abuse images, videos, etc., post them without getting caught. So just like law enforcement has their own manual on how to train and how to investigate its own police forces, pedophiles are doing that all the time. And it's quite ironical when I have always mentioned this at my training programs with the police and others, that the organized crime approach that we take, we understand, we don't know how to translate it into reality. The organized criminal gangs have understood it perfectly. They are more organized than us. They are better networked than us. They are more resourced than us. And most important, they are highly motivated. And we need to reach that level of motivation, resources, networking, collaboration to even attempt to reach where they already are. Well, the the National Association of Man Boy Lovers 25 years ago was running their own online courses on how to molest children, how to get past the well, don't tell your parents. And if your parents say that you should say no, that means you have a choice. So you should say yes. And we found during the tsunamis in Thailand yes. that uh, Nambla owned a number of, of orphanages there where they were mm-hmm. raising children for molestation mm-hmm. boys. They would bring yes. them in young. Uh, they would raise them. They'd be there for sex tourism when people would come. And when the tsunami hit, uh, and the Red Cross was raising money for a, for homes for children that had been decimated. Uh, mm-hmm. They were raising money for some of these owned by NAMBLA until I reached out to Elizabeth Dole, who was running the Red Cross at the time in an event. And I said, you're funding sex trafficking groups that are raising mm-hmm. children for molestation. So it is everywhere. And when you talk about it, people tend to look away. It it's is. too uncomfortable a truth which society doesn't want to face. And the ones who look away also are the ones who may have been abused. Uh, abuse never always means just a highly violent kind of a penetrative, penetrative sexual assault. There are various categories of abuse and we need to recognize all of them because the moment we say abuse, sometimes people get into this Uh, idea of it being a really violent sexual assault on a child, which is not the way it happens. It happens, but not always. And a majority of the ones is where the child is groomed. We haven't yet used that word. The child is prepared to believe what is happening to the child and is being done to the child is really normal. Uh, So I'll, I'll get back to your previous question on when you mentioned about big conferences and big cities. Uh, we uh, we should talk about the terminologies which we often use uh, on situational offenders and preferential sex offenders. Uh, the situa- preferential are the ones which we've always called pedophiles and the situational are the ones which when in a foreign country or when away from home within their own country are in the in uh, not in the presence of family, friends, relatives, are in an anonymous place, in an anonymous situation and when offered seems a little uh, enticing, seems something new to try and knowing you they will never get caught. And possibly there are moral issues there as well. Even if they know legally they will not get caught, uh, there are moral issues which they know how to press that conscience, which within their mind tells them it's wrong, but they know how to suppress it. I work a lot for the United Nations and I think we need to call out uh, institutions, organizations, individuals who talk something and do something else. 
uh, and uh, if we don't talk about our own fallings, we will never be able to find them in the others. We know what the UN, UN peacekeeping forces have done, uh, whether it is in Haiti or whether it is in Congo. We know of the peacekeeping forces buying uh, sex from children by giving them just a loaf of bread. Uh, so uh, and I'm, sh I'm aware and I want to tell the people who are listening this that the UN has got very strong system safety protocols, everything in place to discipline its peacekeeping forces. But it can happen by the protectors who turn perpetrators. Yeah, so often, it, often we're seeing children who are uh, sexually exploited, raped, uh, et cetera, by <laughs> those in authority. And, and they'll yes. listen to it. They don't have a choice in its strength. On the 5th of December, here mm -hmm. in New York, we're actually hosting an event at the UN uh, that's sponsored with my good friend, who's the ambassador to the United Nations from Montenegro. She's got a PhD in telecommunications. She's an engineer and she knows all about this. And mm -hmm. I asked her if she would put together an event for us so where we can discuss some of the mm -hmm. things we're talking about. But mm -hmm. when we talk about understanding who to blame, we're seeing Facebook now threaten mm -hmm. to put Facebook Messenger um, mm -hmm. on end-to-end -end encryption. As you and I both know, they own WhatsApp, which is end-to-end -end encryption, and we're seeing mm -hmm. most, most mm -hmm. of the transmittal of these kind of images in India is happening through WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And there are about 30 million images of child sexual molestation and abuse mm -hmm. last year that were mm -hmm. reported from Facebook Messenger. Um, yes. and if they put it behind end to end encryption, even law enforcement armed with a court order can't mm -hmm. get behind it and save rescue and deal with those children. So we're trying to get a lot of us together to mm -hmm. try to stop that. I don't know that we can, um, but we're working on it because we have to put our children first. Yes. Uh, just to add on to what you said, uh, my very good friend and a very well recognized figure in India, highly awarded also, Dr. Sunita Krishnan, who runs the NGO Prajvala, is someone who always does a lot of legal advocacy as well. And prompted by the rape videos which were being shared on WhatsApp when she went to the Supreme Court, the public interest litigation that she filed also asked for these intermediaries. Uh, such as the internet service providers and social media platforms and others to remove these the content. And when the, the intermediaries readily do so in the Western world, they are fighting tooth and nail by hiring the topmost lawyers, which they are entitled to do, to suggest why they cannot do, do that in India. So the ministries, of course, is involved. The Supreme Court has passed orders saying that uh, the intermediaries also should be responsible in the removal of content uh, as soon as it is uploaded or before even, you know, uh, I mean, before it can be downloaded by people. But it, it's a long battle here. You sometime maybe call Sunita Krishnan on these live chats to figure out how difficult these battles are with the big companies. Uh, where we need to really applaud them also sometimes maybe is where Facebook uh, uh, just a month back maybe and uh, Instagram uh, just two, three days back has removed the like features, uh, the likes feature from its uh, from its services. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I read this, I'm moving away from law now uh, when I talk this. And I say we need to introspect as a society also that for what kind of validation, for what kind of um, approval uh, do we put these pictures out? Uh, do we want people to like? Do we want uh, uh, the, the number of people to show up to people how uh, well appreciated I am, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But also, what is it that is prompting society to hand over smartphones to a three-year-old? What is it that is prompting society not to step into the parenting role, put your take away the phone from the child, which you have the right to a really small child, and say, okay, let's go play in the sand, or let's do some cooking? Or maybe just let's read a book the old fashioned way. Why should a small child, a three year old, four year old, then make videos of touch my body, touch your body, put that on the uh, on Instagram as a small video. Uh, I don't know whether you can put videos on Instagram. I'm also technologically yeah, you can. handicapped. You can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can. Or maybe on other hike or on whatever other mediums that are there. What is a four year old doing showing her tiny little underwear and some pedophile somewhere just getting a kick out of it. How does one even allow that 
to do allow that at home uh, to do to a child so uh, when i say i'm moving away from law here that's where i want to address the whole picture on what are the societal cultural religious political factors economic factors because of which we have all these kinds of really stupidities and evil things which are happening in our society whether we call it violence we call it abuse we call it exploitation whether we call it trafficking whether we call it online or offline abuse what is it that where we as adults are going wrong where we are not able to explain to our children uh, what is good for them what is safe for them it's as if we worry that if we take away the phone from the child something drastic is heavens are going to fall and if we don't educate our children about uh, cyber safety maybe the school will but the question then to go back and take a step backward is are parents aware and that very my yeah my heart sinks every time an educated parent tells me that you know i just about know how to use the computer but my child is so good at it he does what he wants in his room she does what they want in their room and you know they're really good at it and i don't know what they do in their room for hours together and that's when i want to just shake that woman up and say please please be aware on what they are doing so we we really have to go back and question the other surrounding issues and not just the law and the legislations and what companies will do but what each one of us as individuals are going to do well that's the reason when alan and i looked at each other saying have we failed over the last 25 mm -hmm. 30 years mm -hmm. we created a new charity and it's called the cyber safety group and mm -hmm. um if you ever retire from the un and you're allowed to take a position you know my first position is for you mm -hmm. um but we're looking at everything just, just a small clarification i'm not a full time employee with the un just for the benefit of our listeners i'm a home based freelance consultant but one day eventually me and pari are going to work together in a official capacity <laughs> that's it uh, there are all these other issues but um we are yeah. now framing uh mm -hmm. cyber safety standards and the first one we're starting with is crimes against children giving law enforcement access and making sure that the industry works with them to reduce prevent and address crimes against children and we'll be hosting something shortly at Princeton and we're creating all of the guidelines that will deal with this because mm -hmm. it is horrible i was in Kerala at a government school and for those of uh, not familiar government schools are the poorest schools and it was a girls school and i walked in and um one of the girls i it was i was new in india so i said how mm -hmm. many of you've been cyber bullied and no hands went up <laughs> mm -hmm. and i realized that none of them have digital devices and then mm -hmm. one girl stood up and she said well I had somebody blackmail me to try to take mm -hmm. pictures. So I said, "Well, mm -hmm. you don't have a a device." And they said, "Well, my mother does and mm -hmm. uses it sometimes and she had WhatsApp and the open setting at that time, I don't know if it's changed with WhatsApp was someone could send you an image and it loaded directly to your photo stream. You, you didn't, didn't have to click. On. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to click, you don't have to accept it, you don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. And the boy had sent uh sexual images that were mm -hmm. uploaded onto the mother's photo stream and she didn't know about it yet mm -hmm. and then he turned to the girl and he said unless you do this this and this i'm mm -hmm. going to tell your mother that you asked me for those pictures and that's why they're on her phone mm -hmm. and then we had an issue with the head of country for a massive technology company who came to me and he said that his niece had had a morphing situation and morphing is when you take someone else's head the head of your target and put it on mm -hmm. a sexual body we're seeing it with boys being put on homosexual acts we're seeing girls in many different situations um mm -hmm. in india you're not seeing as much uh consensual sexting as you're seeing um in the west so they're manufacturing these images and so these had appeared so the father of the girl went with his head of country for a major tech company and they sat down with the chief of police of a major city in India mm -hmm. and they said this is what went online and the chief of police turned to my friend saying if this were my daughter she would be dead already mm -hmm. so we're dealing with these kind of issues in a country like India where there are honor killings where mm -hmm. 
family reputation is important enough that girls who might have engaged in this are being sent to Canada or, or London or the United States to live with relatives to try to clean up their reputation. We're mm -hmm. seeing very serious instances. We're seeing suicide uh, in connection with sexting and sextortion. We're seeing um, the same problems but magnified because there is no flexibility in the society for mm -hmm. images that might get out there. Yes. Uh, when you mentioned suicide, we have the only one case in India which was reported where a 21-year-old girl, when her image was morphed on a very scantily clad woman uh, and was put on Facebook, uh, she was 21 years old and she committed suicide in January this year from the southern state, in, from one of the southern states in India. Uh, what also uh, therefore suggests to us is uh, the shame and stigma is really culturally based. Uh, what to, uh, in the Western world, a father and a daughter would be on the beach with the daughter wearing a bikini, but in India, just a morphed image of that girl was enough to create shame in her to take her own life. Uh, the same goes with sexting and sextortion. And uh, every day the newspapers are full of uh, reports on revenge porn, on sextortion and blackmail because a couple in their intimate moment uh, decided to record their acts uh, even when they were not, uh, when they were not married, we're seeing uh, blackmail by husband in divorce cases uh, when the couple had recorded these moments and blackmailing the wife so as to uh, get away without paying an alimony or to get the custody of the child. So we have all of these kinds of situations now. Uh, it, it's not about really blaming anyone. I think it's about educating oneself on how far you want to go. Um, recording this as an adult and how far you want to educate yourself so that you can educate your child better and in peculiar contexts of south asia especially and india is not alone here we have pakistan afghanistan nepal bangladesh sri lanka all with a, a different sensibility all with a different uh, sensibility on the dignity of a woman on the dignity of a young person who's a girl uh, on virginity issues on honor killing issues, on uh, the reputation of the family and how more it is attached to a girl child rather than a boy child. And when we bring in all these elements now of sexting, of extortion, etc., uh, th there are added elements of uh, things going so awry uh, that young children or young women are forced to take their own lives because they don't know where to go. Uh, they don't really know what to do about it. And we know, you and me know that what goes on the internet stays on the internet. And therefore the victimization, as we say, is not once, it is multiple times. It's as many times as that image is seen by someone, downloaded by anyone. So uh, unlike the virtual, uh, unlike the real world, in the virtual world, the victimization is just goes on and on. And there are layers upon layers upon layers of that victimization. And uh, we, that's where the crucial thing of education comes in. And that's where I think since we are talking about children and of course about trafficking in general, uh, we know that children have to be a part of the solution. And once they are a part of the solution, they already are a solution itself. You know, how do we ensure justice for children without the children? How well, do we ensure justice for anyone without their own participation? And these crimes will continue to be committed. But haven't we always heard prevention is better than cure? And I think we need to separate a lot of these. There are a lot of people who want to be involved and people who are very excited about helping. So there is traditional sex trafficking, uh, yes. where children who are vulnerable, those who are accessible, those who parents give them up and sell them uh, for profit, yes. where, where you and I, well, we're a little different, where the traditional a consumer won't be able to do much other than support those who are doing as much as they can. They mm -hmm. can report what they see. They can insist that their service providers do a better job. Then yes. we have those where um, children are groomed, lured, or uh, blackmailed if they've engaged in any type of sexting activity, taking a se sexually suggestive or naked or sexual image that gets into the hands of someone who uses it to blackmail them. That's what sextortion is, to yes. engage in producing more images, getting their friends involved, or actually engaging in sex. There, there's a lot that can be done. Mm -hmm. um, we still need some better technology. We need a way that young people can 
report it when an image they've taken voluntarily has gotten into predatorial hands because they're mm -hmm. afraid to go for help, which makes them even more vulnerable. So we need to focus on the policy and the standards and processes and procedures and technology fixes there. And then last are the risks that all of our children have anytime they're engaged in digital life where they're sharing too much information, they're spending too much time online, they don't have real relationships. Um, they play side by side, both looking at a common screen or their own screens, um, mm -hmm. where they don't know how to live in a world of humanity. Um, mm -hmm. And they just see that as life. And we need to make sure that the balance is struck. Parents have the skills they need, children have the skills they need, and all of the stakeholders are better educated and better prepared. Now, mm -hmm. we are 10 minutes over where I promised you 45 minutes, um, but we're still getting comments. People think it's wonderful. Sanjeet, who's been a friend for a very long time, who worked with me in Singapore on the first cyber safety program anywhere, who runs the cyber safety group in Wales, has joined us and complimented you on this. Um, and I think we need to start putting together a task force, groups of volunteers who can do things from raising money so that uh, groups that are doing wonderful work on the ground uh, will be able to do more of that, to raising awareness, uh, to training our children and helping others spot when things go wrong. Delta Airlines has an incredible program to deal with sex trafficking of children. And everyone is trained from the person who takes your ticket to checks you in at the gate to those on the phone in spotting unusual behavior. And, and um, mm -hmm. they'll be receiving an award for this. And there's so many others that are doing great work. Microsoft's doing mm -hmm. great work. Google was the one who put uh, the first internet access at all of the train stations. And I, mm -hmm. uh, you know, three years ago when we started seeing this, it was funny because late at night, no trains and all these men were standing there under the lights texting because at that time data was pretty expensive and they all had Wi-Fi access for porn. Mm -hmm. um, yes. so, you know, we recognize that some of these things are humorous. Uh, some of them are important, but not very important. But the life, safety, and well-being of our children around the world has to be the most important thing we're doing. Sure. Pat, anything you'd like to add before we go dark? Yes, just one more thing. Since you mentioned about people wanting to help, people wanting to be involved in some way or the other, people uh, trying to just pitch in. Uh, even if we are not capable of doing big things, I consider myself a really tiny, tiny, tiny drop in the ocean trying to do something. Even if I, I know I cannot influence government policy, I have a different area of work. Someone may not even be, someone may just be a homemaker. Someone may just be a businessman. Someone is who's logged in is just a simple common citizen trying to live his or her own life peacefully, keeping their children safe. This one thing we all can do for which we cannot make excuses. None of us can make an excuse about informing ourselves on the threats that are there to ourselves first as adults and then to our children because we can be scammed as well on the internet. There's a whole lot of cyber crimes which happen in the financial world, but we could also become uh, victims of some kind of uh, online abuse at times. Uh, we have to therefore inform ourselves, keep us inform our children. There are neighbors who will probably not be able to do that themselves. Can we have a talk with them? Can we just pick up the next person, our next neighbor and say, do you know how your children are under threat? Do you know how your children are vulnerable? Can you please at least do this much? That doesn't require any time, money, effort, anything. It just requires a little bit of motivation. And caring. Of course, and caring as much as I would for my own child as for the others. And although we are, all of us are not blessed to be capable of doing the big things. We are all blessed enough to be able to do the smallest of things. And it is the smallest drop in the ocean which is going to matter at the end of the day. And I want to finish this by quoting from Nelson Mandela, who again spoke about children. And I think we all need to do some soul searching. When he said that there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. Let's go back home and do some soul searching. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, Barry. Thank you.
I love you so much, Gita. And for everybody, my I put a bindi on with my red lipstick. I have a lot of them, but I couldn't find them. So I needed to do something to look a little Very bit Indian. more like <laughs> A little bit. To do something Indian. I, I've got all these sari fabrics, but I'm not built for a sari. Um, so thank you so much, Gita, for the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You are wonderful. And thank you for everybody who visited us. We had a huge group. Um, very diverse, very engaged. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of your questions and comments, but keep asking them. Uh, this will be posted on LinkedIn um, as a, a, an archive video, so you can ask questions there and we'll address them and I'll get some to Gita. Um, so we'll do them after the fact. And we are going to try to do live, uh, LinkedIn live videos, maybe once a week on the things that matter. But you know, you got me thinking, Gita, maybe we should do some cyber safety training for parents um, and others using live. It might be helpful and we can do live on Facebook too. We could, we could. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I love Have you very much. Day, everyone. Thank okay. you. Be safe and well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.